presenting The Fair Youth Vanishes. I'm going to take a rather unorthodox look at Shakespeare's sonnets, first published in 1609. My interpretation of the sonnets will upset many scholars, no disrespect intended, but Stratfordians will get the joke, maybe. I do not believe they were written in the order they appear in the book. Internal evidence suggests that they were written at different times during the poet's life. The task is fitting what is known of his life to events he is referring to in the poems as internal evidence of when they were written. Why do I believe that the sonnets need a new interpretation? The Stratfordian one doesn't make sense, and the other theories require too many assumptions based on scant evidence. Generations of scholars have seen a hidden love triangle story in the sonnets. But I can strip the sequence of sonnets of the alleged love triangle from most of the poems. This simplifies what is really a poetic diary of the writer's life. In Polyptenton's glue, I show that many sonnets are linked by rhetorical figures, such as Hakalotha, Antanaclasis, Antiphrasis, Asterismos, Epanodilepsis, a new one I coined, Polyptiton, Parisologia, and another self-coined rhetorical device, Homo Stoicos. I contend that Ilaism is used in many poems. Ilaism is referring to oneself in the third person. Therefore, the idea that there is a fair youth may be wrong. The poet himself may be the fair youth. Here are the first 18 sonnets which have the word fair in them. Some, I believe, use Ilaism, others do not. Some address himself, and some address other people in his life, and some actually are just general observations of life addressed to the reader and with no particular person in mind. Here are the last 14 sonnets which have the word fair in them. Again, some use Ilaism, some do not. Sybil Yarvin, in Melodrama and the Authorship Question, published in Take the Devere Pill, Explorations in Oxfordianism, writes, Throughout the sonnets, Shakespeare has feelings that are poignant and we should know about them. He's broke and broken. Nobody likes him. Everybody hates him. Nobody but the fair youth understands him. People are being mean to him for no reason. How dare the fair youth abandon him so? Yarvin's insight is important. If de Vere was using Ilaism, this observation makes perfect sense. The fair youth is a personification of his own youth, which was full of promise as a bright young noble living in Queen Elizabeth's court. But it wasn't the fair youth who abandoned him, but life's circumstances and time. Let us take a look at Sonnet 13, which I say uses Ilaism. Oh, that you were yourself, but love, you are no longer yours. Then you yourself here live, against this coming end you should prepare, and your sweet semblance to some other give. So should that beauty which you hold in lease find no determination, then you were yourself again after yourself's decease when your sweet issue, your sweet form should bear. Who let so fair a house fall to decay, which husbandry and honor might uphold, against the stormy gusts of winter's day and barren rage of death's eternal cold? O oh, none but unthrifts, dear my love, you know. You had a father. Let your son say so. 
we will start with a simple gematria sum. The gematria sum of all uppercase letters is 276. When we add the sonnet's number, we get 289. Why is this important? 289 is 17 times 17. The word count is 112. 112 subtract the value of the uppercase O at the beginning is 98, a digit sum number. 98 subtract the number of words with uppercase letters, 17, is 81. Eighty-one subtract the sonnet's number is sixty-eight. The common thread in these numbers is seventeen. We have three multiples of seventeen. Seventeen times one, seventeen times four, and 17 times 17. And we have one digit sum number. 9 plus 8 is 17. The number of puzzles we have found might be a coincidence because 13 is the digits 1 and 3, and 1 plus 3 equals 4. Now we will look at the words. The word you is an example of polypteton and perisologia. Polypteton because it appears in three different ways, as you, yours, and your. And perisologia because there are 17 yous for a clue he is using Ilaism. We have seen in Sonnet 136, in my video for My Name is Will Part 1, that line 7 in that sonnet gives us a clue to find his identity in a number. The line reads, then in the number let me pass untold. The number is 17. Me is the poet's real identity. Pass means to convey or transport or ship. And untold means to be hidden or secret. So this line is saying, I am hidden in the number 17. There are four selves. When you add their line numbers, the line numbers that they appear on, you get 17 again. We add line 7 twice, once for each word. 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 7 is 10, plus 7 is again 17. In another one of those cheeky and a bit facetious authorship clues, the word sweet appears three times for a line number count of 20. As before, we add line 8 twice, once for each word. We will now interpret the words. This is an abbreviation of his title. And if you see it as an abbreviation of his title, the rest of the explanation why he is using Ilaism falls directly in place. On line 1 and half of line 2, he laments that for some reason he is no longer his former self, that you were yourself but love you are no longer yours. He cheekingly calls himself love, as Brits will sometimes do. He tells himself he will live in these poems in part two of the second line. Then you, yourself, here, live. This is in preparation for his impending death, as he explains in line three. Against this coming end you should prepare. Where he will give his semblance to someone else, and your sweet semblance to some other give. Semblance in the context of the poem means two different things. 
he explains in the next line that it is his temporary physical form when he says, that beauty which you hold in lease. And it is his sweet issue, which is his writing and his air. This is very much like what Ben Jonson wrote in his poem to the front matter of the first folio. Look how the father's face lives in his issue. In both instances, we see that issue is a metaphor for his life story. Both his beauty and his sweet issue will bear his form or life. Should that beauty find no determination is a legal phrase for discovery in court. The determination is whether he will leave behind an heir, whether an actual heir or metaphorical heir. He writes, then you were yourself again after yourself to cease. This means if he has an heir of either type, he will regain his identity after his death. Does line 7 have a typographical error? Look at this line carefully. And remember, numbers are very important. Pause and do a bit of thinking. Otherwise, I will go on. I think this missing letter R in your at the very beginning was intentional. This R in after is the central letter of the line because there are 17 letters after it and there are 17 letters before it. The letter occupies the same position as a triumphant Roman emperor does in a triumphal procession. Some of you will recognize this from the catalog of plays from the first folio, which I discussed in solving some first folio enigmas. There are 17 plays listed before the location of the only quaternion in the book, which is in the second part of Henry IV. And there are 17 plays listed after the location of the only quaternion in the book. Recall from my video, The Secret Heart of the First Folio, that the location of the hidden word acrostic is also where the Roman emperor would be. The letter also has a gematria value of 17. The number 17 appears four different ways in this line. First, it is the gematria value of the missing letter in your the very first word in the line. Second, it is the gematria value of the absolute middle letter of the line in after. Third, there are 17 letters before that lowercase r, and there are 17 letters after the lowercase r for a fourth way of getting the 17 enigma inserted into this line. We can conclude the missing letter is intentional and hides a clever authorship puzzle. It is the central letter in the central line of the sonnet. It occupies the same position as a Roman emperor would in his triumphant procession. And of course, self is about himself, the poet, as I explain in Sonnet 134, where he says, and I myself am mortgaged to do to thy will, myself I'll forfeit for that other mine, from my video for my name's will part one, myself means his right real identity. And because he's using Iliism, yourself is myself, which as he says in Sonnet 134 in line three, he gave up for the pen name. In line eight, he says his life will be born by either a child or his works, as I explained a little bit earlier. 
The final quatrain holds clues about the true author of the poem. Who lets so fair a house fall to decay, which husbandry and honor might uphold, against the stormy gusts of winter's day and barren rage of death's eternal cold? First, the word fair is a pun on the real author's surname, Veer. Second, there are 17 letters after fair, just as in line 7, we have 17 letters after the absolute central letter in the line. And the gematria sum of the uppercase letter in this line, the W, is 40. Therefore, the line hides another 1740 allusion. Adding the number of letters in this line to the gematria value 40 gives us 71, which is a mirror image of the true author's succession number. Lastly, this clause, so fair a house fall to decay, alludes to the fall of his house from wealth and stature. His family's fortunes were lost during his lifetime. But he never really lost hope their fortunes could be restored. That is the meaning of which husbandry and honor might uphold. Throughout the sonnets, winter is a metaphor for old age or time, as for example in sonnets 2, 6, 97, and 98. And the stormy gusts of winter's day are just life's problems. Barren rage of death's eternal cold? Well, of course, death follows old age. This theme is found in the previous two quatrains. The last couplet needs a detailed explanation. He reveals more of his past and his present state of mind. Once again, this uppercase O is the initial for his title. When we read it as Oxford, none but unthrips, dear my love, you know, you had a father, let your son say so. You finally understand that this is a poem that uses Iliism. He answers his own question, who would let so fair a house fall to decay, by calling those who helped ruin him and himself unthrips, since he was partially to blame for the losses of his fortune. Once you understand De Vere was the author of the plays and poems, you will find that more often than not, he is not excusing himself from self-criticism. He is absolutely giving himself criticism for a lot of things that he did in his life. The second part of this line, Dear my love you know, is more of the, quote, British Iliism, unquote, at work. The first clause in line 14, You had a father, may be a Captain Obvious clause, but this part, after the R in father, right to the period, has dark undertones. Note the number of characters in the box. He is saying, let my son be able to say the same thing as I say, that I had a father. If we are to believe that De Vere suffered from major bouts of depression, this may be a very oblique way of alluding to suicidal thoughts. If so, this places the poem's composition to not long after surviving heir, Henry de Vere, was born in 1593. The gematria sum of all uppercase letters in the couplet is 60. Adding the sonnet's number, gives you 73. In the Latin alphabet repeating count, the letter value of 73 is D, 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 the homophone 40. This was one of De Vere's primary code numbers. Believe it or not, this poem was chosen at random 
only to demonstrate the use of iliism in the sonnets. It clearly shows how fair can be a hidden pun on his surname and is an extremely strong example of iliism. It puts doubt into the idea that there was a fair youth represented in these poems. This is what one scholar says about who the poems were addressed to. This is Gilbert Wesley Purdy in his paper, Who Shakespeare Wasn't But Is, or Is That Was But Isn't, featured on his blog. It took almost 100 years from the Shakespeare Jubilee that supercharged the field for a third-rate scholar to decide that the only possible explanation for the sonnets was that they were written to the Earl of Southampton. Shakespeare had dedicated two major poems to the Earl after all. The title page of the 1609 quarto edition of the sonnets featured the mysterious initials W.H. Southampton's given name, Henry Rosley, featured the same reverse. This to protect his privacy. I suspect the scholar that Purdy was referring to was Gerald Massey. In his book, Shakespeare's Sonnets Never Before Interpreted, his private friends identify, together with a recorded likeness of himself, in London in 1866. He wrote, Dr. Drake, in his Shakespeare and His Times, 1817, was the first to conjecture that Henry Rosely, the Earl of Southampton, was the friend of Shakespeare who was addressed so affectionately in the sonnets, as well as inscribed to so lovingly in the dedications to his poems. And this is Dr. Nathan Drake's conjecture. If we may be allowed, in our turn, to conjecture, we would fix upon Lord Southampton, all in uppercase letters, as the subject of Shakespeare's sonnets, from the first to the 126th inclusive. This is from Shakespeare and His Times, Volume 2, published in London in 1817. I hope to present more evidence the fair youth was the poet using the rhetorical figure of Iliism. Imagine the poet's words surrounding him as the planets surround the sun. They are scenes from his life orbiting him, his memories recalling now one person or event, then another. The editors of this 2020 collection, All the Sonnets of Shakespeare, Sir Stanley Wells and Dr. Paula Edmondson, were mistaken. According to this evidence, the sonnets are intensely autobiographical. And yet, the idea is not original to me. Charles Armitage Brown wrote in his 1838 book, Shakespeare's Autobiographical Poems, being his sonnets clearly developed, with his character drawn chiefly from his works, wrote, These neglected and ill-understood sonnets contain a clear allusion to events in Shakespeare's life, or rather a history of them with his own thoughts and feelings as comments on them, and consequently they form a valuable addition to our knowledge of his character. He got the right idea, but the wrong man. The fair youth may very well be this man. Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. He was Shakespeare. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.